I'm Carrie Kanoski, and welcome to this month's edition of Kidney Cancer News. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about genomics, the signaling with a focus on MTORC1 based on the previous presentation from Borgi that you heard. Pharmacogenomics, I'll have a slide on sunitinib and pasopinib, and then I'm going to finish up with a case. So we heard very exciting data from the TCGA, and this was a slide that I got from Kim. And obviously we are interested in classifying renal cell carcinoma, and we can classify it based on a number of different factors, whether it be at the DNA level, mRNA, microRNA, or protein. And ultimately, what we are all interested or primarily interested in is isolating groups of patients that respond differently to therapy. So we are interested in being able to identify actionable uh, classifiers. And these fall into two different categories, as you all know. They can either impact treatment or they can impact outcome. And this is what we refer to as predictive and prognostic markers. But of course, I think these two are not equal, and we may be particularly interested in those that affect treatment. And in this context, mutations uh, are, uh, to me, of, uh, and perhaps all of us, of most interest in that they may be predictive and open up new opportunities for therapeutic development. So obviously there is prescient, as was reviewed by Dr. Lienenhan yesterday, for how genes have transformed the field of renal cell carcinoma therapy with the original ident identification of VHL mutations in von Hippel in that patients and subsequent finding of VHL inactivation in probably close to 90% of clear cell renal cell carcinomas. This is a slide that I got from Kim. Um, that shows uh, multiple bars, each of them representing a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And as you can see, the mutation frequency, as she pointed out, is uh, two mutations per megabase. And given that there are 3,000 megabases in the human genome, what we are looking at here is about 6,000 mutations per tumor. So this is not going to be an easy problem. I believe in red, at the top of each bar, you have mutations in protein coding genes, and what you are seeing there is over 50 mutations in protein coding genes, again illustrating the complexity of the problem. This is also a slide that was a courtesy of Dr. Radmel, looking at the mutations that were associated with clear cell renal cell carcinoma at, at a statistically significant p-value after a, a false discovery rate correction. You can see the, the p-values there. And not surprising, at the top of the list, we see VHL and PBRM1. Now, there were 49 and 27 mutations. This is expected. Uh, this is the expected ratio. But perhaps more concerning is that all the other genes are mutated at a rather low frequency. I believe this would correspond to a mutation frequency of about 5 to 10 percent. So the conclusion from, at least my conclusion from this data, which uh, we have also observed in our smaller analysis of uh, genome or exome sequencing of not nine tumors that we've done in the laboratory, and I believe a Japanese group has also found, is that um, most genes that are mutated in clear cell renal cell carcinoma are mutated at low frequency. I'm moving on onto the mTORC1 pathway, and this was the focus of uh, Dr. Gan's talk. This is obviously a pathway that my laboratory is very interested in. I'm not going to review the details, as he has already reviewed them. Uh, suffice to say that we had recently reported the transcription factor EB, which was uh, shown yesterday by Jeff Dom um, to be an important transcription factor, as we all know, in translocation carcinomas, is regulated by mTOR complex 1 which would suggest that mTOR complex 1 inhibitors, uh, such as the Rapalox, may be a good approach for the treatment of this uh, rare group of uh, malignancies. We had previously shown, along with Greg Semenza and um, Bob Abram, that the hypoxia-inducible factor is regulated by mTOR complex 1, and obviously this is the target of VHL, and he regulates this protein, RED1. So as, as you all know, the mTOR complex, mTOR complex 1, plays a critical role in the regulation of cell growth, and it integrates positive signals from growth factors, but it also integrates negative signals, such as from AMP kinase, which is an energy-sensing kinase. So under situations of low energy, in a TSC1, TSC2 dependent manner, largely, mTOR complex 1 is inhibited. Similarly, under situations of hypoxia, 
we have the upregulation of hypoxia inducible ball factor alpha, increased expression of red one, which is directly regulated by both HIF1 and HIF2, and TSC1, TSC2 dependent inhibition of mTOR complex one. Now this poses a bit of a paradigm, or a, a, bit, of, um, a bit of a paradox, I should say because uh, obviously in renal cell carcinoma we have constitutive activation of HIF and this would be expected to induce RED1 and downregulate mTOR complex 1, but mTOR complex 1 is activated. We've examined this recently in the laboratory. Uh, here we are looking at two gene expression arrays, one from the Sanger, the other one from the Dana Farber. And as you can see, RED1 is consistently induced in clear cell renal cell carcinoma. We find this also by real-time PCR as well as by immunohistochemistry. So what is blocking this negative feedback loop, we don't know. This has led, led us to discover somatically acquired mutations in TSC1, which would uncouple this negative feedback loop, but this is only in a small group of patients. We are very interested in RED1 and recently reported the crystal structure, and we have also uh, looked at a mouse with a beta-G insertion in intron 2 that is deficient of RED1 function, which has told us that in some cell types, energy signaling occurs through the LKB1 and AMP kinase pathway. Now, the focus of Dr. Gant's talk was on a family of transcription factors, the FOXO transcription factors, which he proposed uh, serve uh, to impose a checkpoint uh, in tumors that have constitutively active mTOR complex 1. So he showed data of how mutations in TSC1 result in the development of cysts. This is not something that we understand, but uh, as you saw before from Dr. Linehan's talk, it's also observed in BHD deficient kidneys. However, in the context of TSC1 heterozygosity, and this is borrowed from him, uh, you can see that uh, the loss of the FOXO transcription factors results in a substantial increase uh, in the development of renal carcinomas by comparison to TSC1 heterozygous kidneys. Of course, the challenge here is that TSC1 uh, is not lost except for a small percentage of renal cell carcinomas in patients. So, um, one, one way to tackle this problem of uh, FOXO would be by targeting simultaneously both mTOR complex 2 and mTOR complex 1 using catalytic inhibitors. As you all know, the rapalogs are allosteric inhibitors. They bind to the FRB domain. The mTOR catalytic inhibitors bind to the kinase domain and would simultaneously block mTOR complex 2, which is important for AKT activation, which in turn phosphorylates FOXO resulting in 14.33 binding and sequestration in the cytoplasm, and would also inactivate mTOR complex 1. And obviously, there is a lot of interest in this class of drugs. So I'm going to discuss very briefly what are the implications for, for patients of the biology and how we may use some of this information, even if we don't have uh, level 1 or level 2 or level 3 evidence. So this is a patient with tuberous sclerosis complex who presented with a recurrent epithelioid angiomyolipoma. This is not your run-of-the-mill angiomyolipoma. This is actually a very aggressive tumor that metastasizes. And this was in a 24-year-old gentleman. He presented with a hemoglobin of 3.8. As you can see, very poor performance status. This was a recurrent tumor, and embolization failed. He was requiring a lot of uh, units of packed red blood cells. And the tumor was deemed to be inoperable. And this is by our surgeons, who are very good. In particular, this patient was being taken care of by Dr. Rash, who is actually rather aggressive. We don't have established therapies. And what the team recommended for this patient was hospice. However, and this is just to show the histology of the epithelial angiomyolipoma, because the patient had tuberous sclerosis complex and had a germline mutation in TC1 or TC2, we perceived that it would be helpful to consider serolimus. The TSC complex is a proximal inhibitor of mTOR complex 1, and this is what we did. We recommended, I recommended, that the patient be treated with serolimus empirically. This is what the hemoglobin looks like when the patient presented with hemoglobin of less than 4. These are the transfusions that he was getting, and this is what happened after we started the mTOR complex 1 inhibitor. You can see the patient had one transfusion, the hemoglobin is stabilized, and this is what the scans look like. So this is from February to May. It is, of course, an anecdote, but it's, of course, a very meaningful anecdote for the particular patient who was going to be sent to hospice. So I'd like to uh, move now on to pharmacogenomics. And I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. Uh, one slide, um, which is adapted from 
Dr. Van der Velt. Um, again, looking at sunitinib uh, metabolism um, and illustrating some of the genes that they have looked at. So here you have in red uh, genes in whom polymorphisms have been associated with toxicity, and in green genes in whom polymorphisms have been associated with efficacy. And what is um, noteworthy, and I would like for her to comment during the Q&A period, is that not all of the genes are associated with both, as would be expected, for changes, polymorphisms that affect sunitinib metabolism. This is a slide that I believe it's been shown perhaps twice, once by Danny, the other one and the other time by Brian. This is from the actual publication in the JCO and that came out not that long ago. Again, showing that there are polymorphisms on pasopinib. In this case, we are focusing on pharmacodynamic polymorphisms in IL-8, which Pinte and others have shown it's important for the angiogenesis scape in patients treated with sunitinib, as well as HIV-1-alpha. I should point out, as Brian also mentioned, that these p-values, even though statistically significant, they are not corrected for, for multiple comparisons, and in fact, after corrections, they are no longer statistically significant. So there are a number of questions about uh, polymorphisms. Um, so the first one, should these SNPs be incorporated clinically? And in my view, it's still premature. They require prospective validation and evaluation after a false discovery rate correction. Uh, is there a class effect? And obviously, in as much as there is shared metabolism and mechanism of action, one would expect a class effect. And would outcomes be improved by increasing drug exposure? That's really the key question that, that, uh, that comes from, from this analysis. Now, um, my time is up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for a show of hands, even though I cannot see anything. Um, and uh, so, and if it would be interest of interest, I can tell you about a case report. This is a patient for whom we did whole genome sequencing, and what we found, and how we tried to act on that information. I think this is something that we are going to encounter clinically, uh, or we can move to the Q and A. So, whoever, those of you who are interested in hearing this case presentation, please raise your hand, and if you are not interested, we'll move on to the Q and A. Okay, already. So it sounds like there is interest, so I will, I, move, I will move on to the case. So this is a 67-year-old patient of mine who presented with painless hematuria. He had a CT scan that showed a mass embedded in the right kidney, extending into the renal vein. The metastatic workup was negative. He had a radical nephrectomy, which showed a 3.5-centimeter tumor, formant grade 3, extending into the lumen of the renal vein. We have a program in the laboratory to systematically implant tumor from patients into mice. We implant the tumor orthotopically. These tumors macroscopically look like cleosal renal carcinoma and microscopically also preserve the histology in the architecture. Today we've implanted over 100 tumors and it's um, very exciting that it's not only the histology but also the gene expression, molecular genetics, and most importantly, treatment responsiveness that is preserved in these models. For this particular patient, he was followed with uh, imaging studies, and 15 months later, routine imaging studies shown extensive adenopathy as well as a 4 centimeter cetabular metastasis. The patient was, um, was not in a poor prognostic group. I can't remember whether it was in a good or an intermediate group, and sunitinib was begun. At that time, DNA from the primary tumor as well as from peripheral blood monuclear cells was sent out for uh, genome sequencing. These are the findings which we reported in the Personal Genomes Conference at College Spring Harbor last year. We found approximately 6,500 mutations. There were 59 mutations in protein coding genes. Some of these were synonymous, but there were also mutations in splice sites. Uh, interestingly, the technology has gotten so good that we were, in fact, able to validate by Sanger sequencing every single mutation that had, by, that had been identified by Illumina. Uh, these are just the, the percentages of the mutant allele compared to the wild type allele. This is not something I'm, com I'm going to go into, but suffice to say that every mutation was validated. Interestingly, we found a mutation in TSC1. A previous study had failed to identify somatically acquired mutations in renal cell carcinoma. We did find, find one, and we also found a mutation in ERBB4. 
This data was integrated with copy number analysis, both pair copy number as well as allele specific copy number, and the TC1 gene, which is in the long arm of chromosome 9. You can see that there is a deletion here, as you can see here, so the wild type copy had been lost. This was a point mutation affecting a splight site, and it resulted in an in frame deletion of exon 5. So exon 5 was lost from the transcript, but did, this did not alter the frame of the, of the protein. The mutation was accompanied by loss of the wild type allele. We did reconstitution experiments in TSC1 deficient cells and showed that the mutation was a loss of function and that destabilized TSC1. And not surprisingly, we found low TSC1 levels in the tumor in activation of mTOR complex 1. So the patient started on sunitinib and also on solindronic acid. After two cycles, he had improvement in the lymphadenopathy but progression of the acetabular metastasis. Um, he had a resection, and this was stabilized. And then at that point, based on Bob Mozart data, he was uh, switched over to Everalimus. Interestingly, on Everalimus in the second line, he had a stable disease for 12 months. So this contrast to the progression after two cycles of uh, sunitinib. And obviously, this led us to hypothesize that maybe TSC1 mutations, as would be supported by the biology, might be a predictor of responsiveness to mTORC1 inhibitors clinically. How often are these mutations seen? We've done sequencing in 77 tumors, and we only found three additional mutations. By contrast, there was just one mutation in P10. So the patient, at that point, started posopinib and progressed in three months, and then started sorafenib and progressed after two months. And I think this is what all of us encounter clinically, right? So what happens is we put these patients on the different agents, and they keep progressing, and then it gets to a point to, well, what do we do next? What options do we have? Temsirolimus, but as you know, Temsirolimus and Everolimus are both rapalogs, so it's unlikely that this is going to give additive effect. And Bevacizumab interferon, which at this stage where the patient has progressed on 3 VEGF receptor 2 inhibitor, seems to me would have a little hope. Now, the patient did have a mutation on ERBB4, which as you know is a member of the HER2 and EGFR family. We did in silico structural studies to ascertain whether the mutation was compatible with a gain of function mutation. We did in vitro assays, which unfortunately were inconclusive. But as you may know, ERBB4 mutations have been found to occur at high frequency metastatic melanoma. So there is, in fact, a phase two clinical trial looking at lapatinib for the treatment of patients with melanoma in a documented ERBB4 mutation. So at that point, we decided we would try lapatinib. This is obviously off label. Unfortunately, this did not work. The patient progressed when we did imaging studies. And obviously, this raises the question, was progression due to uncoupling of mTOR complex 1 as a consequence of the TSC2 mutation? And should we have considered lapatinib in combination with an mTOR1 inhibitor? And there are such clinical trials for other disease types. So at this point, we decided to switch over to ipilimumab which I think we will be hearing more about, and I think it's an interesting drug, and since it's available for melanoma, we were able to get it for our patient. So I'd like to finish, first of all, by thanking the speakers for their great presentations, and also uh, thanking the people in my laboratory, as well as our colleagues at UT Southwestern and my funding sources. Thank you for your attention. Okay, I believe we have time for, uh, for some questions. So I would invite any questions to the panel. Walter? Can we get the mic? I'll speak loud. You may have to repeat the question. So I guess it's on. Um, one of the challenges here is just the sheer mass of data that's being generated, and I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit. And let's just take, for example, um, to simplify the question, the pharmacogenomic data that's currently available with each one of these drugs. Um, we simply cannot do a large prospective phase three study for each one of these, or even for a collection of the of the um, uh, SNPs uh, in a large population. I mean, we're never going to finish these kind of trials. So, so how do we move forward? How do we take what is potentially interesting data 
and move that forward to clinical application? It's something that we've been struggling with. I don't expect an answer, but maybe some thoughts here from the panel. Excellent question, Brian. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're obviously all, all struggling with the same question, and as I mentioned, it's non-overlapping candidate lists, and then the candidate lists are just our hypotheses about what's important, right? There's not necessarily, uh, we're not necessarily including all the SNPs. So I think, I think with the work that's been done so far, there are some areas of overlap. As I mentioned, there's an effort from the major international groups to, to combine data and samples. Again, still retrospective, but hopefully can solidify those clues and, and uh, tease out things that are just false discovery, et cetera. Uh, and then I think a much more discrete list can be tested in a prospective trial. So, you know, I don't know another way to do it. You know, I, there, is, there, there are some areas of overlap that I think are, are promising and that make biologic sense, especially with metabolism genes and linking that to PK. So I think we, we can move it forward in that way. Astrid, would you like to comment? I agree, I agree with uh, Brian uh, that we have to combine our databases and uh, yeah, first validate it ret retrospectively. Hopefully we can define a gene of uh, polymorphism that are, that are, are interesting uh, for prospective studies. Anybody else would like to comment? And just a very quick comment. I mean, I, I think that we are in a big discovery phase, and, and these things come cyclically. I, I think that things will come together, and it won't be all on our disease group either. I think things that we discover from the other groups will eventually merge together so that it, it is more comprehensible. The only thing I would add is that it seems to me, as Brian alluded to in his talk, that it would be important to define all the polymorphisms that we think are interested in, systematically look at them for all the angiogenesis inhibitors at once. So I think that would be important. Okay. Hi, good morning. My question is a corollary. I think uh, what, I'm, what I had to ask is uh, for the TCGA uh, data that has been collected, is there treatment information and accordingly, you know, are we going to be able to get predictive information also out of it, not just prognostic? Right, there, there is treatment information. These are not uh, clinical trial patients, so these are patients that are treated with whatever standard of care was available at the time um, and, and not with the kind of rigor of a clinical trial. Um, but those are questions that we can at least generate hypotheses with this data. Yeah, because it would be important for the extent of work and the large sample size. A absolutely. The, the first paper will, will only be descriptive, but there will be a, a lot of um, data. It will be a tremendous resource for those kind of questions. Eric? Fantastic session. Really, really interesting. It's exciting to see how things are progressing. Um, question for Dr. Gann. Um, you know, what's really interesting in the VHL patients is that we also see cysts and solid lesions in the kidney, and the question really is, what's the interplay between those? So my question for you is, in your mice, are the solid tumors arising from parenchyma or are they arising from cysts? And the second question is, what's the status of GSK3 beta? Okay, so for the first question is um, the cyst. Yeah, so uh, in, in, our, in the TSC1 TSC knockout mice, uh, we're still not so sure, yeah, the, the renal tumor, whether it's developed from cyst or not. So that's some question we are, we are trying to um, we're trying to address. I don't know whether, whether Jim have any thoughts on that. You probably also have the mice, so the, the, the renal tumor developing in those TSC knockout mice. Yeah, they um, tend to arise in the context of right, There is cyst, yeah, but we are, we are, we're trying to address whether you know, it's those renal tumor developed from the cyst or not. Uh, the second question is about the GSK. So when we look at the, um, so that's an interesting question. So first, in the TSC knockout maps, I think that was already been published by Brent Manning at Harvard Medical School. So typically, we, this feedback, if you consider feedback, those AKT downstream substrate would be uh, uh, the, so it would be consistent with the FOXO, the phosphorination would be uh, decreased in the TSC knockout maps. So this is only, well, only talk about the mouse embryonic fiber blocks. But interestingly, the GSK phosphorination is upregulated. So it's opposite as what we expected, because GSK is also AKD substrate. So they identified actually in the TSC knockout setting, the S6 kinase can actually phosphorinate 
GSK. So the AKT is down, but S6 can is up and is take the place of the uh, the, the uh, AKT. So it phosphorinates the GSK. So in the GSK, phosphorination actually is up in the TSC knockout setting. So that's the opposite as what we expect. Join us again next month for another edition of Kidney Cancer News. I'm Terry Kanoski, wishing you good health.